No, the next speaker is Jared Simpson. He, uh, well, I saw him talk by him about a year ago when he was uh, applying for coming to the YCR. He started up in the spring with us. I'm interested in seeing what he's done since. Uh, he did his undergraduate work at UBC. Uh, he worked in the industry with uh, electronic arts, and then from there he moved into the BC Cancer Agency, where he developed De Novo assembly algorithms. And uh, after that, he left for from Vancouver to Cambridge to do his PhD at the Singer Institute with Richard Durbin. And seeing his talk. Okay, well, yeah, thanks for the introduction, and um, thanks for Lee for giving our opening talk. Um, So we'll be talking about my work on developing a uh, scalable sequence analysis algorithm. Primarily, I'll be talking about uh, the de novo assembly problem, which is where you have sequenced a genome that you know nothing about, and then you try to put it back together, back into the original uh, sequence that, was, that, that you put on the sequencer. So this is a computationally very challenging problem. Um, it's it's traditionally been one of the bottlenecks of a lot of uh, a genome projects of just assembling the data back together. And at the start, I'll be giving an overview of what these computational challenges are, and then talking about some of the methods been, that have been developed in the last five or six years for efficiently working with sequence graphs, which is what we use to represent uh, assemblies. And then I'll talk about how we can uh, use assembly graphs for performing reference-free analysis of genome and population with quite uh, computationally efficient algorithms. So the heart of my talk is really going to be uh, assembly graphs. So an assembly graph we have is the representation of your data. You have sequences traditionally on the vertices, and then they'll, if you have some relationship between the sequences, like say they overlap by some amount uh, of phase pairs, you have an edge in the graph. And the fundamental property of assembly graphs is that some walk through these graphs reconstructs the original sequence of your genome. Um, the graph contains a lot of features. I've, I've got some colored uh, vertices here, which I'm going to come back to later. But you, can, you get certain structures in the graph when you have SNPs or indels, or when you have repetitive sequence, or when you have sequencing errors. And there's a lot of information in these uh, structures in the graph that you can use to extract different features of the genome. Uh, but first, I'm going to talk about how we can actually construct and represent these graphs. So a natural starting point of my talk is around 2007. Coincidentally, that's when I started working in bioinformatics. Uh, but there's also a natural point because this is when Illumina, or what is still called selective sequencing at the time, really started to become popular. Uh, the field of sequence assembly in 2007 was entirely dominated by overlap-based techniques. Um, this is where we had fairly long uh, sequence reads, around 500 bases to a kilobase. And what you do is you align all the sequence pairs against each other, look for the ends overlapping, and if they overlap, you might merge them together. Uh, so the, the human genome project entirely relied on these overlap-based methods of sequence assembly. Now, the problem was in 2007, we had all the software for doing overlap-based assembly. But we got sequence data from Luminous, which was about 27 to 36 bases in length, and then you get about a gigabase per run. So you get tons and tons of data, and it was so short that you couldn't feasibly find all overlaps between reads. So we were in a lot of trouble with assembly, so we basically had to rework the entire field of assembly from, from the ground up. And what a lot of people did is they went back to an old idea that Pavel Pesner uh, proposed, which was using KMERS rather than overlapping sequences. And here, um, uh, this, this model of assembly is called brown graph based assembly. And here, every KMER subsequence of the reads, for example, here's K equals 4, um, and here's the example string that I made the graph from. So every former in this string is a vertex in the graph, and if it overlaps by K minus 1, and it's example 3, we have an edge between adjacent. Now this red camera here is special. It's present twice in the genome, so we have a repeat in this graph where the graph branches into two. Um, now, 
I mentioned before the property uh, of assembly that we use in assembly graphs is that you just find a path to the graph that reconstructs the genome. And in this case, we start at this K where CCGT, follow this lower branch here, and then go back around this repeated vertex and up here. And that path spells out the uh, sequence of our genome. So graph-based assembly is just looking for paths through assembly graphs. Now, the nice property of the round graphs is that they're extremely fast to construct. Here, we're not trying to find overlaps between reads. All we have to do is make a giant hash table, say, of camera sequences, and then we can derive the structure of the graph from that hash table. The drawback, however, is that graphs tend to be extremely large. If you assemble a human genome, the graph might contain 10 billion vertices. Uh, the early implementations of the Brown graph based assembly is that uh, they required greater than 100 bits per vertex. And if you have a graph that's 10 billion vertices in size, you end up having to use hundreds of gigabytes for your assembly. So essentially, what we did is that we traded huge compute dot time for huge memory cost uh, when we started working with this model of assembly. But still, you could actually get your assembler to run if you had a big the early software that was pioneering method in this approach to assembly were developed written by Daniel Servino at the EBI and Euler SR, uh, which is by Hesner's group at UCSD. Now, there's a property of the growing graphs that is very useful, um, and that is that the maximum degree of any vertex is only four. Since each vertex shares k minus one bases with its neighbors, there's only one base that differs between any vertex and its neighbors, one with A, one with C, one with G, and one with T. And this allows us to encode the graphs very efficiently. And what we did in Abyss when I worked at the BC Cancer Agency in Vancouver is that uh, we did the simplest thing that works, which I think is a good method of, of developing uh, new algorithms, and then we just took a giant hash table of hammers, distributed it across a cluster of computers, and then used that as our representation of the graph. And uh, our implementation uses about 300 gigabytes of memory, but that's distributed across, say, 100 computers. So instead of having all that memory located on, on one big computer, you can have uh, as many smaller computers to compute the assembly. And this allowed us to, to make the first human genome assembly from Illumina data. Um, using this growing graph based approach. Now, that still is quite a bit of memory. 300 gigabytes isn't, just, isn't a small amount of memory. You, would, you might not want to do that routinely. So there's been a lot of interest in the last few years in lowering the memory limits of this model of assembly. And it nicely has, it can be it, uh, proposed as, as, as quite a concrete computational problem is that if we have a set of cameras, for example, this set here, which I'll be using in this example, how much memory do we need to use to encode that set of cameras? <coughs> and the first people who took a real theoretical approach to this problem, who by the name Thomas Conway and Andrew Bromage uh, in Melbourne, in Australia, and they represent this set of cameras S using sparse bit vector. So here, what they do is just map every camera to its numerical representation, uh, in the range 0 to 4k, and then set the corresponding bit. So this is what the bit vector would look like, for example, genome with k4 uh, in just this 2D representation of the bit set, where every black box that's filled in is, is one of the cameras that are present. Now, 4 to k is quite a big number for any reasonable size k. Usually when you do assembly, you might use k something like 30 to 60. So you wouldn't want to create a, a single bit vector with four to the k bits. And what you use is sparse encodings of these bit vectors. So essentially, you're just setting, encoding the gaps between successively set bits. And you can come up quite compact with encoding. The theoretical lower bound uh, is four log of four k choose the number of bits that you set. But in practice, that works out to be about 20 bit, 28 bits per k. So now we've gone from hundreds of bits per, per camer to around 100, down to 28 bits per camer. And this is when you can start thinking about doing assembly on commodity hardware. Uh, more recently, bloom filters have become quite popular for doing assembly. Here, it's another bit vector based approach, but instead of setting a bit vector with four to the k bits, you set an upper limit on your size, maybe 100 billion bits, 
and then you hash each camera multiple times and set the corresponding position in the bit vector of the hash codes in code two. And the Bloom filter has this interesting property that it might give you false positives when you query this data structure. So if you say, have I seen this camera before? If you never added it to your Bloom filter, the Bloom filter might say, yes, you have seen this camera before. It's told you the wrong answer. Um, so essentially what you're doing is you're trading off the space of the data structure for query fidelity. The, it will never give you a false negative. So if you have added this to your Bloom filter, it will always tell you that it is in fact present, but it might tell you the wrong answer sometimes. But as it turns out, you're still able to do assembly even with this property that is probabilistic data structure. Uh, this picture here is from one of Titus Brown's papers. And what they use Bloom filters for is partitioning metagenome assembly graphs into connected components. And each one of these circles is uh, a Bloom filter representation of a graph for a different false positive rate. Here is, I think, false positive 1%, and then going up to 20%. And it, the effect of false positives have the effect of fuzzing the graph on it. So you start to get longer and longer chains of these false positive vertices emanating from the boundaries of the graph. But as you can see with the, the cost of bits per tamer, at a 10% false positive rate, you're only using less than five bits per tamer. So you have tiny representations of the graph, but you, you have to account for the fact that it might be telling you the wrong things. Other people have used this approach as well. Um, as Mel said, has used it for camera counting, and Ryan Chickie has been using it for uh, genome assembly, and their implementation uses both 13 bits per camera. Uh, this is still a very active field of, of research in, in, in people who are thinking about algorithmic questions in, in bioinformatics. Uh, and this is just a summary of the various methods that have been uh, made, starting from these early pointer-based graphs, which require hundreds of bits per camera down to bloom filters and these sparse pit vectors, which are now getting to less than 10 bits per hamer. And we're almost at a point where we can do genome assembly of quite complex things on laptop-sized uh, computers. So now I'm going to switch a bit and talk about overlap-based assembly. Um, so I mentioned before that it was computationally quite difficult to do overlap-based assembly from short reads. And during my PhD, we wanted to investigate this and see whether we could, in fact, uh, make overlap-based assembly efficient enough that it would be a competitor to the Hamer-based approaches. And the way that we do this is using a data structure called uh, the string graph, which was proposed by G. Myers around 2005, which is a representation of all the overlaps between reads. I'll give you an example of the string graph here. Instead of breaking reads into Hamers, each read is a vertex in a graph. So as we add a read, we'll add a vertex to the graph. We add a second read to this collection, we'll call it V2. As it overlaps our previous read, we add an edge between them. And in the string graph, all edges are labeled. So here, the, the bit of read 2 that isn't matched by a read 1 is TAC, and we label the edge with that string TAC. And the semantics here are the, is if you add this string, TAC, to read 1, you get an assembly of both of them. An assembly that contains both read 1 and read 2. Uh, again, as we add more reads to the collection, we add more edges where they overlap, again, with string labels. Now we have four reads, and the graph looks like this. Now, you'll notice that I, I drew some edges in this graph with dotted lines. Um, these are what Myers calls transitive edges. And the definition of a transitive edge is any edge whose label is the concatenation of some other path label in the graph. So this label is TAC, CGT, which is concatenation of TAC, CGT. So this edge between V1 and V3 is actually redundant and can be removed from the graph. And this gives you a much more compact encoding of a string graph that has a linear amount of edges rather than uh, amount of edges that are quadratic in the sequence. Of that. So it's a much more efficient encoding of the, of the overlap graph. Uh, the string graph it shares the same property where walks through the graph spell se uh, segments of the genome, just like the broad graph. So um, in Myers' original construction algorithm of this graph, uh, his original construction algorithm for the string graph, 
you needed to compute the full overlap graph first. You need to compute all overlaps between reads, build this overlap graph, and then perform trans or reduction on that. And this, tr this step of build, computing all the overlaps was the bottleneck in overlap-based assembly. So we worked on reducing that and seeing if we could directly output the string graph without having to go the entire <coughs> overlap graph first. The way that we did that is using a data structure known as the FM index. If you use uh, BWA or bow ties, the short read liners, they're built on the same data structure. Um, so the FM index uses this algorithm from hex compression, which is called the Bertels Wheeler Transform. You, what you do is you take your sequence data and then you permute it by sorting every base according to the suffix that it belongs to, and you get a string that looks like this. This string, because you end up with repeated runs of repeated characters, is much easier to compress than your original data. This is what Burroughs and Wheeler were interested in when they designed this algorithm. But as it turns out, you're able to actually search that representation of the data as well. And this was observed by two computer scientists, Barry Gianna and Manzini, uh, in Italy. And what they did is they added an extra index on top of the Burroughs and Wheeler transform to allow you to search. So an example of how you can search the Burroughs the transform using the FM index is you might have a function that's called count where you have just some arbitrary pattern and it will tell you the number of times that string appears in your sequence data by directly searching a compressed representation of the text. Um, the running time of these, these count queries is linear in the length of the pattern rather than the number of occurrences. So it's an excellent way of searching very repetitive text, like genome data or sequence data. So what we did is we took the FM index, and then we derived a set of queries that allow you to compute overlaps using these same techniques as counting. And then once you have, uh, once you know where all the overlaps are, you can extend them to uh, determine the sequence of these edge labels. And in this step, where you turn to determine the sequence of the edge labels, allows us to determine which edges in the graph would be transitive and which edges uh, are the irreducible edges, the ones that are retained in the graph. Uh, so we, we have a paper in bioinformatics in 2010 that described these algorithms. I'm happy to talk about uh, them to anybody who's interested, but I'm not going to go into the exact details of them. But the important thing to note is that by working with the compressed representation of our data, we get both a time-efficient construction algorithm for this assembly graph and also a space-efficient construction algorithm where we can build the string graph in about 64 gigabytes of memory <coughs> for human genome. Okay, so now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about actual practical aspects of assembly that are difficult. So what I just talked about up to now is the computational challenges of assembly, but what actually makes assembly difficult from the standpoint of a user who has just sequenced a genome and wants to put it back together. So you can think of different genome properties that contribute to assembly difficulty. If the genome is very large and very repetitive, it adds a lot of branches to this assembly graph. It makes it more challenging for the assembler to walk through the graph and reconstruct these segments of the genome. If you have very high heterozygosity, it's something that's uh, outbred and it has a SNP every 200 bases, that makes it much more difficult for the assembler um, to find its way through the graph. If it has extreme GC content, it's difficult just to get even sequencing coverage across the genome. All these things must be taken into account uh, when you're designing your assembly strategy. And also just properties of the data. If your sequence reads have high error rate, it's more difficult to assemble. If you have adaptive contamination within the data, it makes it more difficult to assemble, and so on. Um, and so this is a source of frustration for users because they don't really know about any of this stuff before they start their assembly. They just have a, a big pile of reads that they hope are high quality and they want to get assembly out of them. Um, so what I've been working on, or what I worked on for uh, the last half year or so, is a program that I call PreQC, which is designed to measure all of these things, given just a pile of sequence data, of, let's say a VASQ file, and no information about the genome. So it's going to try to predict how repetitive the genome is, what the SNP rate is, and so on, and give that information to the users so they can understand how difficult their assembly is going to be. Um, and we do this by going back to the structure of the assembly graph. So I talked at the beginning about how we have different features of the graph, and it tells us a little bit about the genome. 
So these structures here, where we have a branch that goes out and it comes back together, they typically indicate positions of SNPs or indels in the graph. When we have a high density of branching, like this little cartoon here, uh, that usually indicates a repeat. And we have, and when we have little structures off the graph that just diverge and then die, which we call tips, uh, they typically indicate sequence. So what we can do is we can look at the branches of the graph and build fairly simple statistical models to predict if that branch is due to a variant, if it's due to sequencing error, due to a repeat. And the intuition here is that if you have, uh, say, a SNP, we'd expect the number of reads following one half of the branch and the number of reads following the other half of the branch to be roughly equal. So you can say, perhaps model that with a binomial distribution. Uh, Conversely, if it was a sequencing error, most of the reads will be on one half of the branch rather than the other. So we have just a series of models that runs over the structure of the graph and allows to, us to make predictions of how often the branch, uh, the graph branches due to these three different factors. So the program will give you a report that looks like this. Um, these are six test genomes that I was using during development. Um, this light blue line here is a human genome where this is the predicted uh, rate of SNPs and indels. And we predicted the graph branch is about one in a thousand bases uh, due to a SNP or an indel, which is consistent with what we know about human genomes. Um, if we go up a little bit, this is the, in the red line, it's a boa constrictor. The green line, uh, line is late allowing sick with fish. And they're somewhat more heterozygous than the human genome. And then we go up to a parakeet in the purple, and then this yellow line is oyster genome, which is very heterozygous. There's a SNP every one to 200 bases. And this genome is essentially unassemblable. You, you can't get a, a, a decent assembly because of the heterozygosity of the oyster genome. So immediately, by just running this program on your data, you can see how difficult your assembly is going to be due to the variation. Uh, this is a control down here. This is just a single isolated yeast where it branches about every 30,000 bases, and these are probably just classification errors uh, due to our algorithm. We can also do this for repeat content of the genome. Um, here, this is a function of this Kamer parameter that we use uh, in the graphs with Kamer size. Now, the human genome is one of the most repetitive ones, which is consistent with what we know. The oyster genome, despite only being 600 megabases in size, is comparatively repetitive as the human genome, which is slightly surprising, but also underscores the difficulty of assembling this genome. And then we go down again to the yeast. It, it branches quite infrequently due to repeats, which you'd expect because it's small and, and, and relatively well behaved. Uh, we'll also predict the genome size for it so you, if you don't know it offhand or if you want to confirm the experimental measure of the genome size. This tends to be about accurate to about 10%. We predicted the human genome size to be 2.9 databases, where uh, it's just over three. We also do data quality uh, metrics as well. So we'll estimate the error rate of your sequence data as a function of, uh, of the position. And this is based on actually comparing the read sequences to each other, not just on quality scores, which is what you might get if you just wanted to look at a program like Rasmus. So this program is easy to run. It's quite fast. We can run it in under 24 hours for a human genome. It's only three steps. You just have to build an FM index of your data, run the pre-QC program, which calculates all these metrics, and then you run a Python script, which will generate a PDF report. All of the code is open source and it's on GitHub, so if you're interested, you can go to that URL. And the paper was just published uh, two weeks ago in bioinformatics. So if you want to learn more about the actual method and how we're doing these reference-free characterizations of the genome, you can uh, look at this paper here. OK, so um, now I'm going to talk another about a different application of sequence assembly, which is comparing genomes directly using assembly graphs. So I'm now at, at the OICR, where we're doing a lot of cancer genomics and sequencing a lot of tumor model pairs where the dominant method of finding mutations is by comparing all the reads to a reference genome. Um, this works great for isolated differences like substitution mutations, 
But as you have more and more complex changes in, in tumor, like insertions and deletions, it becomes more difficult to, to correctly place or read onto the reference genome using alignment-based techniques. So what I've been developing um, for over a year now is a way to directly compare tumor genomes to, to the sequence normal using assembly graphs. Um, so, so the way the method works is we go back to the structure of the graph. So as I talked about before, we, when you have SNPs or indels, they form these structures like this, where you have a series of tamers that are on one allele, a series of tamers um, they are on another allele, and they form separate paths through the graph. Now the wonderful thing about uh, using graph-based approaches to detect these sequences is that the actual signature in the graph doesn't change between SNPs and indels. You still have the same bubble structure where you know, uh, all the, the cameras for one allele on one half of the graph and all the cameras for the other allele on the other half. So unlike aligning reads to the reference genome, it's not uh, conceptually harder to find indels than it is SNPs. So we can extend this idea by making graphs uh, of multiple samples put, to put together into the same graph, and you can color the vertices in the graph by which sample they came from. So this is an example of you're going to compare a tumor to a normal. All of the sequences that are unique to the tumor, which is this mutated haplotype here, which has this deleted C, they form a unique branch in the graph. So the variant color problem just becomes finding these unique branches in the graph and assembling them into little haplotypes around this uh, area of the graph. Then you can align these longer sequences to your reference genome and say whether uh, you think this is a somatic mutation or not. So we have uh, we've developed this into a full variant calling pipeline. Um, this is where the benefit of all this, these years of research on efficient representation of sequence graphs comes into handy because we don't need to use huge memory for this. We can get away with, well, I'd say only 100 gigabytes of memory, but I assure you, in, in assembly terms, this is quite small. Um, you, can, you can do this whole tumor normal comparison using only 100 gigabytes of memory you, with, uh, within about, say, two days of, of long, long time. We find that typically about 10% of mutations are indels that we're currently benchmarking. Uh, these programs using uh, ICGC data and part of the larger ICGC benchmark. We typically find that it's some, we're better on calling indels, but we have lower sensitivity for substitution mutations because you require higher coverage to have complete paths through uh, the assembly graph. So we, we still need to merge in um, calls by reference uh, methods, but we, we seem to be improving upon indel calls using these assembly based methods. Okay, so the last thing I'm going to talk about is just work that I'm uh, doing with my postdoc, Marina, who's sitting back there, on extending these reference-free algorithms. Um, so instead of exploring genomes, exploring entire populations, and uh, what we're doing here is we made a PCA plot of Kamer sharing in the thousand genomes data, um, and we're able to reconstruct the ancestry of each sample by uh, the frequency of cameras that are shared between pairs of samples. So we, we've made a PCA, all uh, blue dots here are samples from Africa, and uh, the red dots are European, lighter green is uh, South Asia, and darker green, green is East Asia, and you can see that we can clearly separate out the African populations from the modern African population using the first component, and then the second component clearly separates separates non-African populations. And the benefit of this approach is that it's only based on camera counting, so it's extremely fast. Running all of this program doesn't require alignment to the genome. You can just do this in a single pass over the data using a keyword tree, and you can get these counts extremely, extremely rapidly. So we can do this in a matter of just days rather than months of, of, of compute, which normal population-based methods would take. Right, so I'm going to stop there. I think I have about 10 minutes of questions. So in the last five or six years, we've had this profound improvement in assembly algorithms, which has given us 100 times decrease in memory usage and allowed us to push assembly algorithms into different areas of sequence analysis. 
and now we're able to, to develop these interactive tree algorithms to give you very rapid results, uh, which still give you meaningful information about for instance, population structure. So I'll stop by just thanking my postdocs, Maria and Mate, um, for working with me on, on some of these projects, and also my collaborators from the Sanger Institute, Richard Durbin, Shane McCarthy, and Case Albers. Um, I don't have Leo on here, but Leo deserves a mention for helping me with mathematics of uh, this camera based model for exploring genomes. And uh, Ryan Chicky, Sean Jackman, and Paul Medvedev, who uh, worked with me on, on representation of the growing So I'll we'll stop there and take any questions. Questions for Jared? pushing these representations of the graphs in terms of memory usage, we're doing metagenomic assembly. Because there it's even harder than uh, sequencing, say, a human genome. Because if you just sequence a soil sample, there's so much diversity in it that there's not enough information shared that you end up with this graph with 100 billion vertices or a trillion vertices. So they're all interested in, 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 in these very efficient representations. The Bloom filter one, for example, was, was designed for that. So yeah, I see all of these algorithms being applied to to manage genomics, especially um, yeah, especially the blue field, which is what types of interesting. Do you think this can be applied to data like exome data, or it has to be like full genome sequencing? For my like sure. cancer. Uh, yeah, like we don't try people finding bells. Sometimes yeah. you sequence the exome, and we only got the reference genome, right? Just to get the region, the differential snips. But what about emails? Can we get emails with these tools? Yes, you can. Um, there's a few caveats. Like you, what happens at the edges of uh -huh. pull-down regions, it, it, it affects what happens in the graph. But for most indels, you can you can find them using this. If people have data and they want to run this on Exome, I'd be happy to to help and take a look at it. Yeah. Yes, so I have two questions. I don't know which one is more interesting. So one is, uh, do you use hypo do you lose haplotype information in these graphs, or could you still incorporate that somehow? There are longer haplotypes than this. So, the, from Illumina data, you don't have enough information to to sort of track the haplotypes. You you have SNPs every thousand base and the region only hundred bases. So you lose that information quite quickly, at least for human. Um, but we're working together um, on. Say is that we want to use see what happens with the when we have 10 kb long reads and whether you can retain that information to do phasing directly on the graph. So we're very much interested in that, but uh, you need not much longer data for that to become a practical approach. And so people have been also talking about just having a huge graph for all the human sequence, for example, or something for years, for all I know. The human like, pan genome graph. Human pan genome graph, like from 2008 or 9, where Velvet came up. So right. How is that coming along? Uh, people are still talking about it. Um, <laughs> people are still interested in it. Uh, the missing piece for that is aligning to the graph. Like, we could construct the, the human pan genome ground graph right now. It, it's, and it, in fact, it exists. Like, Sam Ball has a representation of all the thousand genomes data in graph format. But nobody's written that piece of software where we can align a new set of data into the graph and then have it annotated in, say, reference-based coordinates. If people but still want to use the well, reference annotation. You have an index, right? You could just. Why, why, is it, why is it hard? Um, maybe it's not hard, but <laughs> nobody's just taking it up. <laughs> maybe somebody here wants to take it. <laughs> I, I don't need projects. <laughs> you, you said people still want to have kind of a reference-based approach to it in the end, but do you think it's possible for us to have a glorious reference-free future? You know, if we, you could get the whole the whole tool suite um, working on a, on a string graph um, everywhere, you know, so that, so that people could use browsers that are, yeah. that are, that work on a graph instead of assembly, 
um, all of their data could be referenced to a graph instead of a simple API. Right. That's possible, feasible. This is better. Question. I think so. It would, it would take a huge investment, obviously, because like, all of our interest, all of the downstream analysis is working off of the annotated graphs. Um, so you, you, we need to make this huge switch into having an annotated reference graph and then and then uh, doing everything working off of that. I don't know if it's easier to sort of have just the reference sequence being some path through the graph and then sort of like lifting over all the information onto that reference path once you get something new or just getting rid of this quality of a reference altogether and, and, and annotating the graph. Um, but there are serious problems to solve. I'm not. I don't quite sure. I'm not quite sure how how that would work. Um, but definitely having some idea of this this whole population rather than a fixed genome is going to happen at some point. But who knows what the point is? Any other burning questions? Okay, join me in thanking Jared.